What's up, Church by the Glades? How's everyone doing today? Hey, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Abe, and I get the privilege of being one of the pastors on staff here at Church by the Glades. Uh, specifically, I get the privilege of leading our Lake Worth campus here at our church. So I'm hanging out with you today on a day that I would typically be in Palm Beach County, but man, it's a pleasure to get to share God's word with you. But we also have some other folks uh, joining us um, right now, so we'd like to welcome them. Uh, first up, our folks that are joining us live online, what's up? Hey, thanks for joining in on service. We hope you're enjoying from wherever you are. Uh, second group of people are those who are joining from Sample Road Campus, Sample Road. We're so grateful that you would tune in. And then finally, save the best for last, Homestead and Dade CI. Man, I heard great news that we had like over 100 people go through the prison training for prison ministry. So uh, that's, that's amazing. If, that, if you're one of those people, uh, just know that we're grateful and that God's gonna do some amazing things through you. Uh, to reach uh, those folks who are at Homestead and Day TI. Uh, but listen, I don't have too much time with you guys here this morning. So do you mind if we just jump into the Word of God? Uh, so I, I've had a couple of really important milestones happen in my life lately. Uh, the first was that last year in July, I turned 30 years old, which is a big deal apparently. I didn't know it until I turned 30, and then all of a sudden I started questioning the meaning of life. And uh, the second milestone is one that we've all gone through together, and it's to turn the corner to a completely different decade when it became 2020. Like, wow, I didn't know how uh, mind-boggling that would be for me too, but it was like, whoa, we're ending one decade and starting a new one. Uh, so that's a pretty big deal. And here, uh, you know, lately in my life, something that God's convicted me about is not reading the Bible enough. So that's something that I've wanted to change, and I made a commitment to read the Bible more than ever before this year, and uh, I'm sticking to it, and it's gone great. I used to have this boss who used to tell me, son, if you get into this book, and this book gets into you, it will change your life, and I'm experiencing that right now. So we're going to open up just by jumping into God's Word. You guys ready for that? Um, we're gonna be reading Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. So quickly before we start reading, I wanna let you know that this was a book that was originally supposed to be a letter uh, written to a group of Christians that were living in Rome. And the author of this letter was Paul, the Apostle Paul. Paul is kinda like this iconic figure in the Christian faith. We wouldn't know as much as we do about God if it hadn't been for Paul and his writings and his teachings. And the book of Romans, it's this very academic document. It's almost as if it was like Paul's thesis, okay? If Paul was getting a doctorate in Christianity, this would be his thesis. Um, so it's super academic, but then once chapter 11 ends and it turns the corner to chapter 12, it goes from being academic to becoming very practical. How awful would it be if, if, if the, our knowledge about God was something that would never translate into real life. Like that would be boring, that would be like a, a tasteless life to live, uh, and thankfully God's word is actually applicable. And if we put it into practice and we set it into motion, it has the potential to change everything. So here we go, this is what Paul writes at the end of chapter 11. This is the conclusion to the academic portion of this document. He says this, have you ever come on anything quite like this extravagant generosity of God? This deep, deep wisdom, it's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done him such a huge favor that God has to ask his advice? Everything comes from him, everything happens through him, everything ends up in him. Get ready to read the underlying words with me. Paul goes on to say this, always glory, always praise, yes, yes, yes. The importance of this passage is first, that the infinite mind of God is something that the finite human mind can simply not fathom. To try to understand and comprehend the ways of God, the wisdom of God, the will of God, has been, is, and will always be an impossible task. Paul, this, this really smart guy, he's written the foremost dissertation on the doctrine of our faith. I mean, Romans chapter 11 is one of the most foundational uh, uh, pieces of scripture that we have that explains 
what we believe and why we believe it. And yet Paul himself, with all of his education, with all of his experience, with all the inspiration from the Holy Spirit, having had an encounter with Jesus Christ, he still can only reach one simple conclusion, which is the following. God, you're awesome. God, you are awesome. And when I say awesome, I don't mean awesome in the way that you and I typically use this word in our daily vernacular. I mean awesome as in the literal sense of the definition as Webster's English Dictionary tells us. This is how it defines the word awesome. It says this, to be extremely impressive or daunting and inspiring great admiration, apprehension, or fear. That's what I mean when I say that God is awesome. I mean to say that God is awesome like the northern lights are awesome. I mean to say God is awesome like a silverback gorilla roaring and ruling in the jungle is awesome. I mean awesome like the destruction that an atomic bomb leaves in its wake. I mean awesome like the greatest and newest invention given to us by Popeye's, a spicy chicken sandwich which, oh, by the way, is available on Sunday afternoon after service, praise God. Chick-fil-A is not open, but Popeye sure is. That's what I mean when I say awesome. Yet when compared to all these things, they pale in comparison to the awesomeness of our God. God is so great, God is amazing, God is awesome. So Paul, Man, he says, I can give it my best shot. I can try to simplify this as best as I can, but at the end of the day, I will fail. I will fail because God is that awesome. He says it, he says, who, who, who can explain God? No one. But then Paul starts writing to a different tune in, in Romans chapter 12, and it almost seems like he's contradicting himself. It's interesting what he does. Uh, let's read it together. Romans chapter 12, verses one through two. He says this, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values or customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves, get ready to read the underline, what the will, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. See, what I find so interesting is Paul in chapter 11, we read it together, he says, man, who can understand the ways of God? But then in chapter 12, he says, well, let's press the pause button real quick. While you may not be able to understand the will of God, like the overarching will of God for all of mankind, while you may not be able to step back and see the big picture of what God is doing, while you may not be able to put all the little pieces of the puzzle together, there is actually a way that you can discover God's plan and purpose for your life. See, God's, God's will for the world may be just too grand for you to understand, but you can actually discover God's will for your unique individual life. And I don't know about you, but if God has a plan for my life, I want that plan to become a reality. Because how many of you guys have made plans that never become a reality, right? We all know what it's like to make all these plans, but those plans don't go anywhere. You see, when it comes to God's plan for my life, I want that to become real. I want it to be fulfilled. I want every promise that God has for me in this good book to come to pass. That's why we're in this series. That's why we're in this series called Built to Last because we wanna remind you that God wants to build something of lasting eternal value in your life. He wants you to leave a legacy that not just has an earthly impact, but also an eternal impact. And we also want to remind you that if you want to see God's blueprint for your life become a reality, that there's a part that we must play. There's something to be done on 
our end of things. So week one, Pastor David talked about the importance of building a firm foundation for our lives. And he likened it to the building of the Empire State Building. He talked about how uh, those who worked on that building, for three months they did nothing but dig down so that they could make sure the foundation was just right. And Pastor David likened that to how we should focus on our foundation and how Jesus Christ is the only foundation worth building our lives on. He is the solid rock on which we can stand firmly that will stand the test of the storms of life. Week two, he talked about the importance of work. Everyone say work. He talked about the importance of work directly in correlation to the word of God. He said something like this, God's word won't work unless you work God's word. You actually have to do what God's word says. And when you put those things into motion, it changes your life. Well, today, this morning, I wanna focus on, uh, on your beliefs. And I wanna talk about the impact that your beliefs have on whatever it is you're building. You see, once the, uh, once the people who were working on the Empire State Building finished the foundation, there were still months and months and months of more work to be done, right? See, once they got the foundation just right, then they actually had to put up the skeleton of the building, or what I would call the bones of a building. Our location over there in Lake Worth, it's a building that's been around for a long time. It was formerly First Baptist uh, of Lake Worth. It was built, I believe, like in the 50s, and that building is in great condition today. You might say that that building has great bones. The technical term for this in construction is beams, the beams of a building. Here's a picture of the beams of a building. Now, you don't really often see the beams of a building exposed. They're actually hidden for, for, for aesthetic value, for aesthetic purpose, but it's these beams that make sure that a building stands upright. And the bigger the building, the more important that the beams are built well. Bringing it full circle, what is this? Why, why, why are you giving me this lecture in architecture and, and structural engineering, Gabe? Here's the thing, your beliefs about yourself, your beliefs about others, your beliefs about the world, your beliefs about who God is, behave in your life like the beams in a building. And what you need to know is that if your beliefs are faulty, if your beliefs are not sound, then your life will not be able to endure the stress loads of everything that God has planned for you. You see, God has such big plans and purposes for your life, but here's the thing, is your, you need to make sure that your life has an infrastructure, has, has a belief system that is strong enough to sustain what God wants to actually do in your life. And most of us never end up seeing God's plans in our life become a reality because if God were to unleash his blessings in our lives while we operate under our current system of beliefs, so many of us would be crushed beneath the weight of his will our life would not be able to sustain whatever it is God is doing. And that's how great God's plans and purposes and promises for your life truly are. So you have to make sure that you get your beliefs in order. So many of us want God to reveal his plans for our life. We wanna know like, God, what is it that you're doing? Like, why, why are things going this way? Let, just give me a glimpse of what it is you wanna do in my life. But the truth is, is that God can't reveal his plans for you until you make sure that your beliefs are in order. And in order to do that, you have to renew your mind because your beliefs are formed in your mind. And when you renew your mind, like Paul says in Romans chapter 12, then your belief system is also renewed. And here's what you need to know. God won't reveal if you won't renew. God won't reveal if you won't renew. You have to renew your mind, you have to renew your beliefs. So I wanna give you an example personally of how a limiting belief, in other words, an unhealthy belief in my life has held me back in certain occasions when God is trying to do something big in me and through me, okay? Uh, I, I wanna talk to you about a limiting belief that kind of came from uh, the way that I was raised. 
See, like so many of you guys in this room, like so many others that are joining us online or watching from another campus, I am the son of two immigrants, okay? My parents immigrated to this great nation nearly 40 years ago, and it was one of the best decisions that they ever made. I'm eternally grateful for the fact that my parents came to this great country. I love the United States of America. Uh, we're not perfect. We got a lot of work to do, but man, we're still pretty cool. So when my parents made the decision to come over here, my mom uh, tells this story of what happened when she set foot on American soil for the very first time. She says that she got off the plane, okay, and she looked out to the horizon, and she said these four simple words, I'm here to work. I'm here to work. What a powerful statement. She said, I'm here to work. She knew that God had brought her here with a purpose, and she knew that if she was going to see God's plans in her life come to pass, that that was gonna take some good old work ethic. Now, I tell you all this to give you some background on who my mom is. My mom is the definition of a fighter. She's a survivor. My mom grew up in El Salvador, which is this small, small country. Uh, we got us, oh, hey, Salvadoreña, awesome. Uh, yeah, my mom grew up in this small country that was brutally ravaged by civil war. Um, she grew up uh, dealing with a lot of childhood illnesses too. So when my mom got here, she had been hardened by life and she was ready uh, uh, you know, to work hard and to give it her all. And she wanted to raise us with that same kind of work ethic. So my mom would give us these pep talks when we were younger. But before she would give us these pep talks, every morning she would wake us up, she'd make us breakfast, we'd sit at the breakfast table. And my mom uh, was so concerned with making sure that we showed up to school ready. She wanted to make sure that, that, that our homework had been done. She wanted to make sure that our book bag was in order. She wanted to make sure that we looked presentable, that, that, we, that, you know, that we looked like uh, our clothes had been ironed and, and, and looked like she had put effort to getting us ready. And she also wanted to make sure that we showed up to school looking as if we were eager, excited, and ready to learn. She wanted, that, she wanted for my sister and I to make a good impression on our school teacher. So one of her greatest pet peeves was for us to show up to school looking tired. So when we would wake up in the mornings and we would be eating breakfast, our eyes would be like nearly swollen shut because you know what happens when you just wake up. You're like barely see out of your eyes, so you kind of go to the breakfast table. And my mom, would, would, she'd take these ice cubes and she'd put them in her hands. And she let them uh, start melting just enough so her hands would get ice cold. And then she would come up behind us and she would put her ice cold hands over our eyes to bring down the swelling around our eyes. And what would end up happening is this would obviously shock us into being awake and we would be alert and, and, and annoyed but ready to learn, right? We were annoyed but ready to learn. And we looked like we were like well rested. So along with that, on our car rides to school, my mom would give us these pep talks and she would say this, she would say, listen, your father and I came here so that you would have better opportunities. And if you're going to honor our sacrifice, if you wanna become something of worth, you're gonna have to work hard and you're gonna have to study hard. And when you get to school and when those other little kids start distracting you, you better tell them to shut up because you're there so that you can one day become a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, an architect, whatever it is you want to do. You're gonna become something great, but you're gonna have to work hard. You're gonna have to make it happen. She would say this, this phrase in Spanish. And she would say this, se tiene que quemar las pestañas estudiando, which loosely translated meant, you better hit the books so hard studying that your eyes roll out of your head. Now this pep talk, it did wonders for my sister. My sister became an unstoppable force academically. My sister went on to graduate high school and go on to an Ivy League institution. My sister did so well in high school that Bill Gates paid for her entire college education. She did amazing. And, uh, well, for me, uh, not so much. It wasn't until hours before my high school graduation that I found out that I was actually gonna be able to walk across the stage. That, that's, how, that's how 
razor thin my margin for error was in my high school career. And what I want to tell you about is, is this limiting belief that started shaping itself when I became young. Because you see, what my mom meant to say to encourage me and challenge me, it actually kind of had this weird effect on me. And when I heard my mom say that, hey, if you don't like working hard, if you're opposed to hard work, then you'll never become anything. And if you don't become anything, then you're a disappointment. And in my mind, I was like a lot of other kids. Do you remember yourself when you were a kid? I would rather watch TV than read. I would rather play than study. I would rather daydream than focus. So when I realized that I actually don't like working hard, working hard sucks. When that finally like started to sink in, I started to develop this limiting belief that I would never amount to anything because I didn't like to work hard. So in the back of my mind, I always had this belief like, I don't know if you, you got what it takes, man. I don't know that you're wired to win. I don't know that you have it in you to succeed and to excel and to do something great. So even when I went on to join the military and, and even when I started gaining momentum in my life, even when I discovered my passion for ministry and became a pastor, in the back of my mind, I've always had this limiting belief that eventually I'll reach this glass ceiling, that I won't be able to, to, to uh, grow beyond my lack of work ethic and that at the end of the day, I, I'll just get stuck and I'll, I'll be doomed for mediocrity. And I want you to hear me on this. I'm not blaming my mom. My mom did an amazing job raising us. Uh, a lot of you guys are like, great, another millennial blaming his parents for everything. Like, okay, boomer, that's not what's happening here. Uh, I'm just illustrating, I'm illustrating this, that the enemy is a master manip manipulator. And if you give him one inch of ground in your mind, he will take a mile and he'll start spinning these elaborate lies that you're not capable of whatever it is God has set out for you. And nothing could be further from the truth. And I know if I struggle with some limiting beliefs, I know that there's someone else here today that is also struggling with some limiting beliefs. Maybe your limiting beliefs are centered around your finances. First of all, if you're here and you're struggling financially, or even if you're doing well financially, and, and you're just looking for some next steps, looking to learn more, looking to learn about the way that God has called you to manage your money, I encourage you to really sign up for Financial Peace University. You ought to do that. It has the potential to change your life and it really brings some financial peace to you. But may, like I said, maybe you have limiting beliefs about your finances. Maybe those beliefs sound something like this, like there's never enough to go around. In other words, you have a scarcity mindset instead of a, an abundance mindset. The other one is this, I have to protect what I've got because there just isn't enough. Money is made to be spent or rich people are bad people. Maybe your li limiting beliefs uh, center around your relationships and maybe, maybe you believe the lie that I'm not worthy of being loved or all the good ones are taken or no one wants me or I'm useless on my own. Maybe you have limiting beliefs about yourself. I'm a failure. I can't make things happen. I don't deserve a better life. Things just don't work out for me. Or finally, it's all my parents' fault. The good news is this, is that if you're willing to put in the work, that you can renew your mind, and as a result, your beliefs can be renewed as well, so that you can go on and see God's plans for your life be fulfilled. In order to do that, I'm gonna give you some, some, some steps, some pointers. The first thing you have to do if you want your mind to be renewed is to recognize. I want you to, to ball up your fists like this. Everybody do it. Look at your neighbor and say, you better recognize. You better recognize. You better recognize what? You better recognize that every single one of you are currently operating under a limiting belief. None of us make it through this life unscathed from the power and the influence of a, of a limiting belief. Now maybe you're here and, and, and you're like, well, I don't know what that limiting belief is. Well, you better recognize whatever that limiting belief is. You have to find out what it is because you have one and you have to name it. You have to put a face to it. 
Because when you put a name to it, when you get put a face to it, now you know where you're shooting at. Now you know what you're aiming for. Now you know what you gotta take down. And if you hear and you don't know what your limiting belief is, just look at your behaviors. Pinpoint the behaviors that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you need to address. What are the behaviors that every new year you're like, all right, this is the year. What is it? I gotta quit this, or I gotta quit that, or I gotta start this, or I gotta start that. Find whatever those behaviors are because here's the thing is most of us spend our lives chasing our tails, focusing on the behaviors that need to be changed. When we shouldn't be focused on the behaviors, we need to be focused on the beliefs that are at the root cause of those behaviors. God is not in the business of behavior modification. He is in the business of belief transformation. God's not worried about your behaviors. He's just trying to change the way you think, change the way you believe. So maybe you're here and you have these destructive behaviors in your finances. Maybe you waste all your money on material things. Maybe you waste your money on clothes. You waste your money on shoes. You waste your money on cars that you can't afford. You waste your money on experiences that are out of your budget. Maybe you're the person that's like, yeah, this next round's all on me. <laughs> Maybe you're the type of guy that thinks that you need to impress the girl and you gotta take her to a five-star restaurant on the first day and you gotta overdraft your bank account just to afford the valet. Some of you guys are like, all right, who gave him my Bank of America login, bro? That's not cool. <laughs> I tell you that because I've been there before. I've engaged in those negative financial behaviors. And I'll tell you this, it wasn't until I started addressing the belief that was at the core of that behavior that things changed for me. And the belief that I had was that in order to gain the acceptance of others, I had to dress like this. I had to drive that. I had to eat here. And it wasn't until I addressed that that my finances started getting in order. The beliefs, the beliefs first and then the behaviors will follow. The second thing you have to do if you want to renew your beliefs, renew your mind, is once you recognize what that limiting belief is, is you need to reject or refrain. Now there are some limiting beliefs that you just have to altogether reject. Altogether, like it's just invalid, you just get rid of that belief. For example, if you're here today and you're under the impression that you are not worthy of love, you need to altogether reject that belief. That is not true. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That's not true. Not only are you worthy of being loved, but you are loved. You are loved, that's a fact. So you just reject that. But there are other beliefs that maybe you shouldn't reject altogether. There are some beliefs that you need to reframe. For example, maybe you have this belief that no one would ever want to hire you. Well, maybe there's some truth to that. I'm not taking shots, I'm just trying to help you out. Limiting beliefs are sometimes very powerful because oftentimes there's a morsel of truth in them. But here's the thing, and, and married people know this better than anyone, a half-truth is still one big, whole, fat lie. Is it not? A half-truth is still one big lie. So don't give that limiting belief too much credit, but sometimes you need to acknowledge, okay, maybe there is just a teeny, little weeny piece of truth in here. And maybe nobody's hiring me because I'm not representing myself well in the interview process. Maybe no one's hiring me because I haven't done enough to advance myself. Maybe I've procrastinated and put off getting this extra credential for too long. Maybe I've put off my college education for too long. Maybe I just haven't improved myself in too long and that's why people aren't taking a look at my resume. Or maybe you need to realize that you're just bad with people and that you gotta look in the mirror and you gotta say, all right, maybe nobody's hiring me because no one wants to be around me. So when it comes to those truths, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You just have to reframe it a little bit, come at it from a different perspective. And how you reframe a belief like that is you say, hey, listen, I recognize I'm not perfect. I recognize I have my shortcomings. 
but I also recognize that if I address these issues, if I face the person in the mirror, that anyone would be honored to hire me. Anyone would be honored to see my resume. Anyone would be honored to pay me for my work. That brings me to my last and final point. Is finally, you need to remember. Everyone say remember. Remember, what do you need to remember? Well, remember that at some point, that limiting belief actually served you well. That it was actually useful. Dare I say, borderline beneficial, necessary. See, this is what psychologists will tell you. Psychologists will tell you that the mind, the human mind, develops limiting beliefs in order so that we can be better at coping with the harsh realities of the world. So that we can navigate the brokenness that's in this world. So that we can cope with our existence and maintain the status quo of the lives that we believe we've been destined to live. So sometimes you have to look at your limiting belief and be like, okay, I see you. I, I see why you've been here all along. You also need to remember to thank that limiting belief. You need to thank it. You need to say, hey, thank you. Thank you for helping me deal with my abuse during my childhood. Thank you for helping me deal and cope with the divorce of my parents. Hey, thank you for helping me navigate poverty. Thank you for helping me get through that tragic loss. But as you thank them, also let those limiting beliefs know that their services are no longer needed because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is upgrading you and where you're headed, you don't need limiting beliefs, you need liberating truths. Liberating truths like I am redeemed, I am forgiven, I am loved, I am capable, I am wise, I am purpose, I am renewed, because that's the truth. So what is it? What is it that's holding you back? What is it that's keeping you from having a life that is strong and stable and sure enough to withstand all of God's dreams and his vision for your life. Because if you wanna build something that lasts in this broken world, you gotta address your beliefs. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you so much, so, so very much, God, that you have a plan for our life, Lord. That you, the, the maker of the heavens and the earth, would also create a vision for our life, a blueprint for our life. So God, I pray that we would honor that by focusing on our beliefs and working on ourselves to improve. And it's in your mighty and powerful name we pray, amen.